I've got a great game for you from the Tata Steel Masters. The world champion Magnus Carlsen faces five-time national champion and world junior champion Perham. Both players are super grandmasters rated above 2,700. And, uh, of course, Magnus, world champion, number one in the world. But, uh, yeah, Perham, Pram, I'm not sure how to say his name, 2719. Again, five-time national champion of Iran and world junior champion uh, in 2018. Anyway, let's go ahead and get right into the game. Pram begins with pawn to d4. We have pawn to d5 and now pawn to c4. So the queen's gambit put on the board by the Iranian super grandmaster. We have declined by Magnus with pawn to e6, and now knight to c3, knight f6, c captures d5, e captures d5, and now bishop to g5. This has all been played tens of thousands of times in grandmaster play. This is just book opening here. And now bishop to e7, pawn now to e3, by the Iranian Grandmaster, and now pawn to h6 by Magnus. Bishop back to h4 now, and now Magnus plays bishop to g4. And this has never been played before in Grandmaster, well, in master level play. So the top chess players in the world have never played this move. It's not been recorded. So this is a novelty, which is probably by design by Magnus. Uh, you know, he these these super grandmasters certainly have these lines memorized very deeply, and this uh, should get white out of opening preparation. So Pram is not likely to have expected this move, but he plays a very strong move in response, just queen to a4 check. We have pawn to c6 by Magnus, and now bishop to d3, developing that bishop to a fantastic square. Magnus castles kingside here, and now we have pawn to h3 here, attacking the bishop. Magnus actually moves his bishop back to h5, which I find a little bit odd. He's trapping his bishop here, um, and yeah, uh, so the, the engine actually says moving the bishop all the way back is better, which I wouldn't want to do that either, uh, just really limiting. Anyway, we'll continue with what happens on the chessboard. Queen now to c2, and now we do see that that bishop is likely to get trapped. Uh, pawn now to c5 by Magnus, he doesn't seem to care. Uh, this is the best possible move in the position. And now we do see the pawn coming to g4. Magnus plays c captures on d4 first here. We have... E captures on d4 by the Iranian national champion, and now bishop to g6. This is being called a brilliant move, um, or no, a great move. It was the only move really to play in the position, it seems like to me. Uh, yeah, but the trouble is bishop captures on g6, pawn captures on g6, and then queen captures on g6, and Magnus has given up a pawn here. He's down a pawn in the position, which is unfortunate, but uh, he has a, a trick up his sleeve. It seems like he lost a pawn, but now he actually plays knight captures g4 here, seemingly blundering the knight, but the trouble is, yeah, the... The bishop is a loose piece. We always want to keep loose pieces in mind, so undefended pieces, because interesting tactics can happen to them, and they can fall off the board. And so, yeah, the uh, Magnus is able to get a pawn back here because he's going to be able to uh, be capturing that bishop. Pram plays the best possible move in the position, just queen to e6 check. We have the rook blocking. This is the best way to play it. And now pawn captures on g4 by the Iranian national champion and now bishop captures on h4 as we have the queen and the the bishop we're attacking that bishop knight now to f3 is the best move for white and now queen to f6 asking for for a trade here and it's it's basically forced as well how are you going to save this knight here there's two attackers coming we got the, we got this battery so you know you can't move your queen and try to defend this so the the queen trade basically forced here and the bishop is able to save himself, so Prem not going down any material, and we have a completely even position as far as material is concerned. We have knight captures on d5 by the Iranian national champion, and now knight to c6 by Magnus, doubling up on that pawn on d4. Parham decides he wants to hang on to his pawn. He plays rook to d1 here. It would have been better to castle here, um... 
I'm not sure why he didn't castle. It's, it's saying that either move is okay. Maybe because the queens are off the board, he decides not to castle. Uh, maybe he wants to activate his king early. But with with the two rooks on the board, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Let's take a look at what he should have done. Yeah, so instead he should have castled. And that way he would be defending this pawn, which is uh, going to come under attack. He's also defending this, you know, a difficult isolated pawn. Uh, rook to d8 would be best for black. And then knight captures... And then the knight should go ahead and capture the bishop on f6. Rook captures f6. And now that pawn is not really in danger anymore. Uh, rook to h3 would be best for white. And uh, yeah, this would be a much better position than the one that uh, Magnus allowed him on the chessboard after rook to d1 was played by mistake here. Yeah, just, yeah, should have, well, it wasn't a mistake. It just wasn't the strongest move. It just makes more sense for him to have castled over here and, and protected this pawn. Uh, but that's not what happened on the chessboard. Let's go back to what actually did happen in the game. So Parham plays rook to d1. When we continue with Magnus playing rook to e8 here, checking the king. Knight now to e3, a strong way to go in the position. And now Magnus lifts his rook to e4. We have pawn to d5, best move in the position by Parham. And now knight to b4 by Magnus, attacking the a2 pawn. And also, of course... The B2 pawn is under attack, so this is why he should have castled. This is just, I, I mean, the engine says that this is defensible, but it already feels fairly hopeless for white in this position. Parham plays pawn to D6 here. This is not the best move. He should have actually castled queenside would have been better. Uh, this is just being called inaccuracy, though, so we'll just go ahead and continue. Yeah, so the trouble is the, in the position, these two pawns are unlikely to survive and then magnus has got connected past pawns over on the uh, king's queen side there so yeah that seems very dangerous um so we have knight to c2 with check king to e2 and now knight captures on e3 by magnus pawn captures on e3 magnus grabs the g4 pawn and uh Parham lives his rook to d5 here. It's saying rook to d5 is the best move here, but also actually um, pawn to d7 actually is very strong. Pawn to d7 should have been played here, and uh, the bishop would be forced back to the blockade. Uh, yeah, bishop d8 is really the only way to play this, and so that preserves these pawns over here, and, uh, you know, yeah, white has easily drawing chances, or even, I mean, both players have winning chances. This pawn being way back there uh, could be a serious problem for Magnus. But uh, he doesn't play this move. Instead, he plays uh, rook to d5, and now Magnus plays rook to d7, preventing this move from ever happening and limiting his scope. Uh, so now white plays rook to f2 here. This is being called a mistake. He should have instead played... Uh, knight to d2, but in that variation, there's still no way to really save both of these pawns. So we're not going to go into that. We're just going to continue with what actually happened on the chessboard. We have bishop captures b2 by Magnus, and now rook to d3 by Param. This is being called a blunder. The gentleman has blundered here. He should have played rook to b1, and we'll go ahead and take a look at that variation now. So instead, the Iranian national champion should have played rook to b1 here, attacking the bishop. Magnus would probably move his bishop back to f6s. That's the best move in the position. White then moves the king to d3, and uh, this would have been a stronger position for Perham. Magnus is up a pawn here, but... Um, often a pawn is not enough to win, uh, a position between two grandmasters like that. If you're only up a pawn, yeah, a lot of times it's hard to win that position. Anyway, let's go back to what actually happened on the chessboard. So Parham plays rook to d3 and we continue with Magnus playing bishop back to f6 now, being called an inaccuracy, saying going ahead and playing rook a4, attacking the pawn would be best. Parham now lifts his rook to d5, best possible move in the position, and Magnus plays rook to b4. Parham doubles his rooks with rook f to d1 here. Again, suggesting the knight should go to d2 here. In fact, the variation that Stockfish recommends just calmly loses the game. Um, it ends up sacrificing these pawns and getting nothing in return. So, 
I mean, <laughs> if Barham had imagined this line, I imagine he would be like, no, I don't really want to just lose two more pawns for nothing. But maybe there's nothing to do be done here. Let's just continue with what actually happened on the chessboard. Magnus continues with king to f7. Got to activate your king in an endgame. And, uh, you know, this position likely to trade into an endgame soon. Parham moves his rook to d3. This is a fine move in the position. And now Magnus attacks the rook here with king to e6. You say attacks, like that's defended. It's not really attacking. Uh, putting pressure of the rook on the rook is an important thing. It actually allows uh, Magnus to win a pawn here in a moment. Parham now moves his knight back to d2. This is the best move in position. And now Magnus plays rook a4. Parham advances the pawn to a3, which is an okay move in the position. It, it would have been better to actually play pawn to... Uh, e4, that makes a lot more sense to me as it defends the rook. The trouble with um, the trouble with a3 is that pawn is not really defended as Magnus can just go ahead and capture it. So he gains a pawn here. You have rook captures on a3 by white, but now king captures on d5 by Magnus. And this is an absolutely dominant position now. He's up two pawns and this is now an end game. And in the end game, you should activate your king. You want to get your king like, like centralized, ready in the action as it is the second strongest piece on the board. The, the knights and bishops definitely not as strong as a king. And Magnus has his king in the center. So this is just totally lost really for white at this point. Uh, we have rook captures on a7, best possible move. King captures on d7, best for black. And now knight to e4 by the Iranian national champion. Magnus advances his king d5 here, and we have knight capturing the bishop on f6. Pawn captures bishop, and yeah, this messes up uh, Magnus's pawn structure, but again, he's up two pawns here. He uh, can afford to lose some of them. He plays, Magnus plays king to c4 here, and now we have rook to f6. Magnus does defend this pawn. Uh, Magnus doesn't need all these pawns. In fact, this h pawn is basically useless. If somehow the Iranian champion was able to trade off um, these three pawns over here and Magnus was only left with the h pawn, it would be totally drawn. There would be no way Magnus could progress. Yeah, Super Grandmaster is not going to allow you to promote an h pawn or an a pawn. Those guys are basically impossible under good defense. Anyway, we continue with what happens on the board. Parham plays rook to f four check. Magnus moves his king to b3. And now we have rook to f5 by the Iranian national champion. Magnus moves his king to a4. He's looking to ferry his pawn, his b pawn up the board here. This is the best possible move. White plays rook to f4, trying not to allow this. King now to a5 by Magnus and now rook over to h4. Magnus doesn't care about that pawn. He plays pawn to b5. We have rook captures on h6. I mean, there's really not much to be done. This is a completely lost end game. I think a lot of grandmasters would have resigned already. So I, I really applaud this gentleman, Parham, uh, for fighting on in this position. He's playing the world champion and this is hopeless. Uh, so, you know, thank you for making Magnus at least show that he knows what he's doing here. We have pawn to e4 by white, and now Magnus plays king to a4. We have pawn to e5 by the Iranian champion. Yeah, there's only one move that works here. You obviously can't capture the pawn with your pawn, or you lose your rook and the game. Well, actually, it would probably end up being a draw. Uh, so you do have to play rook to e6 here, pinning the pawn, Perham grabs the pawn, and we have pawn captures pawn once again. And uh, yeah, this is again just a known endgame. This is assault. Yeah, any chess master knows how to win this endgame, but we'll continue. We have king to d8 by white, and now Magnus plays rook to c5. You got to keep the king away from that pawn uh, in order to win this, this endgame. We have rook to a6 by white and now king to b3 by magnus rook over to d6 by white and now magnus plays king to a3 he's trying to get his pawn up the board we have rook to a6 by the iranian champion champion and now magnus plays king to b2 we have rook to d6 once again by the iranian champion and now magnus advances his pawn to b3 again this is just like 
chess masters all know this uh, variation. So again, I'm impressed that uh, Parham, he's, he's fighting to the very end. He's going to make sure that this world champion is for real. Does he really know his end game theory? Uh, yes, yes, he does. Um, <laughs> we now have uh, king to b1 by Magnus, and uh, Perham plays best possible move, just king to d2 here. Magnus advances his pawn to b2, and this is just the Luciana position. Um, I'm actually doing a video on this. I've taught classes on this before, but this is a Luciana position. This has been known for like 400 years, how to win this endgame. We continue with rook to a8 by... Parham, and now Magnus plays rook to d5, and it is in this position on move 56 that the Iranian champion does re resign the game to the world champion. Uh, again, this is called the Lu you can play this with a couple of different ways, but the, the way that I know how to solve it is called the Luciana position. And yeah, so you, you can't play king here. Let's just take a quick look at that. If you play king here, well, then you just step out of the way and uh, there's nothing to be done to stop the pawn. You're actually shielding my king from checks. Uh, and yeah, I mean, best move is basically to sacrifice your rook because I'm going to get a queen. And so you have to sacrifice your rook. And then it's just a box mate, which is one of the fundamental checkmates that you have to know. Any super grandmaster definitely knows it. I've known it since I was like a 1600. So um, yeah, or probably even before that. Anyway, so yeah, you need to uh, know this this checkmate, uh, the box mate. And I do have a video linked for the box mate if you want a short version or a long version. Anyway, let's go back. So if instead you move the king away, this is exactly what you want in the Luciana position. The, the opponent's king needs to be two rows away in order to pull off this little dance, this little shimmy that we're going to do here. And now you go ahead and poke your king out. So you can go ahead and move your king out here. And it was thought to be a draw for hundreds of years, perhaps more than a thousand years. This was believed to be a draw in this position. And uh, it's because basically you can just check the king perpetually. Uh, th th that was believed anyway. You got to maintain defense of your pawn here, of course. So you got to move here. And if they, they really should at this point just go ahead and take the pawn. Uh, if if you're playing against somebody and you think they might know this variation, you have to capture the pawn here and then hope they don't know how to checkmate with a rook and a king, which if they know this variation, they probably do know how to do that. But anyway, if they go ahead and check again, this is why the perpetual doesn't work. So Magnus had his rook you know, on the exact right square to be able to block now. So rook here, rook blocks, and yeah, you, black's going to get a queen. So they didn't have to use the box mate. He just can use the most important checkmate in chess. Check out my video on that. Uh, the queen and king versus kingmate. And, and, and yes, it's, so it's important, as I mentioned, that you're not... Uh, the, the king is more than two rows away because, yeah, if the king was sitting here or here, he could just step in, black promotes to a queen, and then it's captured. But because it's so far away, you're going to get a queen, and then, yeah, you just have to be able to do the queen and king versus king checkmate, or I think I have it on a short as most important checkmate in chess, but I also do a longer version of it as well. So yeah, definitely check that out if you don't know how to do that checkmate. It is the most important checkmate in chess. So yeah, it does make sense that the Iranian grandmaster did resign the game. Uh, and I'm surprised, like I said, that he continued to press Magnus to see how good his endgame skills are. I'm sure they are. I know they are fabulous. Thank you for joining me for that. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe as I will be posting more of the games from the Tata Steel. I'm going to post every uh, decisive game from the Tata Steel. And I'm also co covering other chess players and other tournaments. Please let me know if there's a tournament you think I should cover or a player that needs a deeper dive into them if they are a master or above. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. Take care, everybody. Also, I will be teaching classes. Um, I am plan on doing group or individual classes if you'd like to through Zoom. So please do join my virtual chess club. You can just uh, comment to me if you're interested in that virtual, virtual chess club. But uh, yeah, take care, everybody. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye. Take care.